Um, Hi everybody. Welcome to the colloquia. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Bernard Wood today. He's a professor of human origins and human evolutionary anatomy at George Washington University. He was trained in medicine and paleoanthropology at the University of London and has earned degrees of Bachelor's of Science, Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy, and Doctor of Science. His interest in paleoanthropology began with when he was invited by Richard Leakey to be a member of his first expedition to Lake Turkana. Since then, he's made exceptional contributions to paleoanthropology, particularly to our understanding of the phylogeny of the human lineage and genus Homo. Um, he has provided seminal work on the value and ability of morphological traits to be used as information for creating phylogenies and refining techniques in cladistics. The definition of our own genus has been long and contentious, and since the publication of the Neanderthal genome and evidence suggesting interbreeding between Neanderthals, Denisovans, and non-African Homo sapiens, this has only become more exciting. Um, Dr. Wood has been at the center of defining the homogeneous and describing diversity in the human clade. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wood. Thank you very much indeed. It's very nice of you to be here. I, um, I know there is food, but I somehow suspect that the quality of the food is not the reason that, why you're here. Um, the, uh, the, um, if I were you, I would keep the lights on, unless you really want them off. Because if you turn the lights off and I'm in the audience, I go fast asleep. I have never actually fallen asleep while giving a talk, but there's always a, there's always a first time for it. Um, the, I certainly fell asleep when I was a junior doctor talking to a patient. I was so tired that I nodded off on her bed and she very nicely woke me up and said that she knew that I'd been working the whole weekend and that she was very sorry and she hoped that I could have a good night's sleep. Okay. Um, what I want to do, your, your colloquium is about extinction, which is not something that, that, that paleoanthropologists um, spend a lot of time thinking about, although some of my colleagues do, and I will try and point out to you why I think it's a rather dumb thing to do. Um, so um, let, me, let me try and do that. And I know that this is a mixture of cultural anthropologists and um, one biological anthropologist plus some biological anthropology students and a, and a bunch of archaeologists. So this is not going to be, you know, look what a clever chap I am sort of talk. This is going to try and help you, help you understand what your biological and anthropological colleagues are interested in. So just to remind you that, uh, that probably one of the major contributions of Charles Darwin was to think about life in the form of a tree. And um, his particular genius was that he um, suggested that... Uh, and so all the species that are alive today are on the surface of this three-dimensional tree. And all the species that have ever lived in the past are in the tree. And so what you have to have are branches in the tree that lead to the species that exist today. <coughs> what you don't have to have, but we do have, are branches in the tree that lead to extinct species that are no longer living. Okay. So some of my colleagues, they tend to interpret the hominin fossil record as that everything has to be an ancestor of modern humans. Um, so, just as the fact that I must have a mother and a father, and I must have grandparents, there is no reason why I must have an uncle or an aunt. Somebody else probably must have them, but I don't have to have them. Um, so, uh, so, what I'm going to try and persuade you is that the hominin fossil record does not just consist of ancestors of modern humans, it consists of a bunch of branches, most of which didn't find their way to the surface of the tree. In other words, they're not alive today. Because even though you think some of your colleagues are strange, they still belong to the same species. <laughs> um, 
So, this is the point I was making. When I was a lad, the, the, uh, the conventional wisdom that was, that was taught to me is much the same, not in terms of the details here, but the conventional wisdom was that modern humans were so different from the great apes that we deserved our own family. That's a big sort of category. And that family was called the hominidae, and therefore human ancestors were called hominids, which is the informal version of that. Now, for reasons that I will tell you about in a second, um, we, we know as much as you can know anything in biology uh, that um, chimpanzees and bonobos are more closely related to modern humans than they are to gorillas. Now, if you think this is something to get your head around, imagine being a chimpanzee or a bonobo, and you, somebody tries to persuade you that you're more closely related to the people going around the zoo than you are to the guys in, in the next door enclosure. <laughs> sort of scratch your head and think that doesn't make sense, but that's, believe me, there is a lot of evidence that's that suggests that um, um, chimpanzees and bonobos are more closely related to, to modern humans than they are to gorillas. So the, the surface of the tree of life around us looks like this. Um, here are modern humans. Um, here are common chimpanzees and bonobos and mountain and lowland gorillas and, and orangutans from, uh, from Borneo and Sumatra. If you look at the genetic differences between these, um, and the chimpanzees and bonobos uh, were separated by the emergence of the Congo River, the bonobos south of the Congo River, the common chimpanzees to the north and west and east. And that probably occurred a couple of million years ago, which luckily coincides with the information that the um, uh, um, uh, geographers and geologists have about the origin of the Congo River. So the Congo River is an example of, of the formation of species because of a geographical barrier. Um, like all teachers, I'm giving you the example that works best. Okay. There are lots of examples where speciation has occurred and we don't really understand the, uh, the mechanism, but that's a very obvious mechanism. So basically, if somebody asks me at a party, what do I do? I say, well, I'm interested in what happened between the common ancestor of chimpanzees and bonobos, and they're already left, okay, because, because they don't know what a chimpanzee or a bonobo is, or they're Republican, and they don't want to think about these sorts of things. So I say, I'm interested in what happens between the hypothetical common ancestor of chimps, bonobos, and modern humans. And so basically, I'm interested in that line. Now, the fossil evidence that we think that might be relevant <coughs> to that line looks like this. And what I've done for the biological anthropologists is to break this down and to color code it. Uh, so, uh, so anatomically, modern humans are here. Uh, the grade I've called pre-modern homo is this color. These are, these are creatures, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. This might not be a separate species, and I just want to warn you that this is a really specious interpretation of the fossil record. There are some colleagues who would recognize about half the number of species, but I'm showing you a rather specious interpretation of the hominin fossil record. So these guys, if you met them on Scepter, you would probably, you know, you might want to move into the next next rail car, but, but, but you would probably not be alarmed. If you met any of these guys on Satcho, you would wonder, you know, what's going on, because, because their body proportions are much more ape-like, the, the, uh, the brain size is smaller. Um, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis um, have some of these primitive characters and some rather more derived ones. And then there are a bunch of taxa here, which everybody who found <coughs> each one of those taxa, um, taxa is absolutely convinced that they have found the earliest hominin. <laughs> okay. 
Firstly, they can't all be right. Okay. My guess is that probably none of them are right, but, but nonetheless. So I'm just going to call these possible early hominins rather than to anoint them as being, as being hominin ancestors. So what I'm going to do, because this is a museum, is to go through how this was accumulated through sort of history. Uh, this is millions of years here. And this is the current information. So all the, uh, the, the, the images I'm going to show you don't necessarily have what was thought about the dates of early hominins at the time they were discovered. The, uh, the, columns are, the, the columns are based on the most recent information. And you have to realize that this is 1931. And the Pliocene went back to 200,000 years. The Pliocene started 450,000 years ago. And the Miocene started 900,000 oh, no, um, 900, years ago. So, um, so the columns I'm going to situate in relation to the, uh, the dating evidence that we have now. And the base of each column is what's called the first appearance date. In other words, it's the... It's the earliest we see that particular species in, in the fossil record. And the top of the column is the last appearance date, which is the, the most recent evidence we have of that species in the hominin fossil record. As night follows day, it's quite certain that the species was around before it's in the, the fossil record. And as night follows day, it's quite certain that it stayed longer than the last time we see it in the fossil record. So the first appearance dates are the, uh, the minimum appearance date, and the last appearance date are the, the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the maximum last appearance date. In other words, the species quite probably existed after that, and, and almost certainly was around before that. And you must realize that a lot of the tops and bottoms of these columns represent the fact that there are just no longer sediments around where the fossils could be found. It's not that the fossils, it's not that the species became extinct at that time, it's just that we no longer can find any fossil evidence for it. So it's the old maxim, you know, the, the the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In other words, just because we don't find the fossils, it doesn't mean it's gone away. It's gone. It's either extinct. And the other thing is that it might not be there, not because it's extinct, but because it moved to a different part of, of the continent of Africa. Because everything from here, everything from here downwards is all African. And the other thing you have to realize is that the, the fossil sites that are represented here by uh, the, uh, the species that you see on the diagram, they cover probably less than 4% of the land surface of Africa. So if you think that magically we have managed to sample everything that's ever happened in human evolution by looking at 4%, of the land surface of Africa, you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, I can't prove that you're wrong, but it's just, you know, it just doesn't seem very likely. And so there is probably even more complexity than this rather speciose um, diagram suggests. So if we go back to the sort of thing that, that Darwin would have been aware of in 18. 50. Uh, the only taxon we knew was, uh, was modern humans. If you look at a book published, there is, there is no other taxon. And you can argue that uh, one of the earliest evidence for modern humans comes from, from a cave in Wales, um, the Goat's Hole Cave. And there is the Goat's Hole Cave. There is the Goat's Hole Cave. It's on 
It's on a rather nice part of South Wales called the, uh, the Mumbles. And if you ever want a place to go, if you ever want to go on vacation, it's a very pleasant place. It's a very pleasant place. And um, here is the skeleton that was found in the early 1800s. It's called the Red Lady of Paviland. Uh, the only problem is it's a male. And, and so, uh, uh, but you know, that's the way things go. So the, if we now go to 1900, and you look at a book, or you look at an encyclopedia, you would now, if you were looking at the entry for human evolution, it probably wouldn't be called evolution, but you would now learn about Homo neanderthalensis and Homo erectus. Um, Homo neanderthalensis, Joachim Neander was a Lutheran sort of ecclesiastical poet who, as far as my reading, uh, got a little too friendly with the boys at the school and uh, <coughs> was dismissed. Um, but um, he gave his name to the valley, and so uh, the, the, uh, the binomial is, uh, is Homo neanderthalensis. And the, the discoveries were made in that valley at the Feldhofer Cave in 1856. And so that was the first non, that was the first evidence of a close relative of ours that wasn't, that wasn't modern human. Um, there is the Felthoff, uh, the Felthoff, the, uh, the cave is down here. He went there to write, you know, to get inspiration to write Heavens. When this was taken, it was an open cast mind. So I don't think you would, you would come up with any really bright ideas for the works <coughs> for him if you went there. <laughs> Today, with hindsight, we're not the first Neanderthals. Uh, the first Neanderthals to be found was probably this charred skull, uh, which came from a cave in Belgium, and uh, this cranium here, which was found in 1848 on the, um, on the Rock of Gibraltar, a cave in the Rock of Gibraltar. So in hindsight, these are probably the earliest Neanderthal fossils to be discovered. What about Homo erectus? Well, um, Homo erectus was, was discovered largely because of the influence of Ernst Haeckel, who unlike Darwin, um, Darwin was convinced that the African apes were more closely related to modern humans than the Asian apes, whereas, whereas Ernst Haeckel was convinced that the Asian apes were more closely related to modern humans. Whereas Darwin suggested, therefore, that if you wanted to find evidence of human evolution, you should go and look in Africa. If you use the logic of Haeckel, you should go and look in Asia. And that's what this guy did, who um, read Haeckel's book, and he was a doctor, and he managed to, uh, to, uh, to join the Dutch East India Company, and he went out to the island of Java, which is now part of Indonesia. And then in the early 1890s, he discovered the, uh, um, he initiated some excavations, and they were really nicely done excavations. If you go to Leiden, you can see the excavation notebooks, and you can see the photographs of the excavations. They were done in a very serious and, and, and effective way. So this clearly was not a, was not a modern human. It had a pretty small, it had a brain volume which was substantially less than a thousand degrees, and even your worst enemy probably has a brain volume of 1300 cc. And so, um, so initially he thought this was, what, um, he was probably a fossil chimpanzee, but a fossil chimpanzee that was walking erect because of the nature of the, of the femur, so he called it Anthropopithecus. And then he changed his mind, a year later he changed his mind, and he, um, he scrubbed out Anthropopithecus and he called it Pithecanthropus. Um, we no longer use that, uh, the genus, but that's what he called it. So that was the beginning of Homo erectus. 
So if we now move to, uh, to five years after I was born, when I wasn't really yet interested in human evolution, <laughs> there are some more taxa on the scene. There is Homo heidelbergensis, which was enigmatic then, and we still don't really have a well-developed understanding of Homo heidelbergensis. Is heidelbergensis essentially the ancestor of Neanderthals, and maybe you should just merge Heidelbergensis into Homo neanderthalensis, or is Heidelbergensis something other than just the ancestor of Neanderthals? <clears throat> By that time, discoveries had started to be made, not just in Asia and in Europe, but in Africa. So these discoveries... Oh, sorry, there's a bit of a glitch. <clears throat> if you go to Sussex, you go to the village of Piltdown, uh, you, can, you can find a pub which is called the Piltdown Man, which serves really passable beer, <laughs> but you would regard it as warm, but, but that's the bad news. The warmth is the bad news. The good news is that it actually tastes of beer. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and this is where this man, Charles Dawson, had been looking for fossils, and he had been, um, he was an attorney, which explains everything, and he was an attorney who was looking after an estate called Barkham Manor. And somebody had said that there were fossils being discovered there, and he started to dig these pits along the drive that went up to Barkham Manor. And he managed to interest a man called Sir Arthur, Sir Arthur Smith, Woodward, who was um, who worked at the Natural History Museum in London, and to cut a long story short, um, the um, Dawson claimed to have recovered uh, some pieces of the skull and this jaw and these artifacts from the gravels of Peltdown. The um, this created a, a big stir, and you have no idea. I mean, if you look at the Illustrated London News, this is the front page of the New York Times. Now, can you imagine any piece of science making that impression on the New York Times these days? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, Donald Trump's this, or Carly Fiorina's that, but, you know, this was just... You know, this was all over the, so that, so that was the, uh, the front cover of the Illustrated London News. This is the front page of the New York Times. This is a magazine called, uh, called, called Popular Science. And so, um, and the thing about Peltdown Man is that it had a very large brain. And it had a rather ape-like jaw. The reason it had a very large brain was because it was a modern human brain, and the reason it had a very blank jaw is that it was an orangutan jaw. Okay. The problem was that when Raymond died, oh, and it wasn't until the 1950s that Sir Wilfred Woodrow Clark and Joe Biner and Kenneth Oakley, um, uh, they could they collaborated to show that the jaw was, um, had been stained, that it was an orangutan jaw, and they showed that the, um, and this was one of the most effective uses of fluorine um, dating, which is a relative um, dating method, and they showed that the amounts of fluorine in these, in these bones were not the same. And the really damning thing was that there was an elephant, I think a mammoth bone or a tooth, which um, Dawson claimed had been found there, and it was radioactive. <laughs> and there was only one place where that people knew where mammoths were being found in an environment that was radioactive, and that was in North Africa. Okay, and. And he had gone to a store and he had bought this mammoth tooth. And he had just put it into the collection. 
So that was a problem because the expectation of and the expectation according to Piltdown was a large brain and an ape-like jaw. So when Raymond Dart found something with rather modern human looking teeth and a small brain, he was swimming up a stream against the current. Okay. He was claiming, I found what I think is a human ancestor, but it don't look at all like the one that you think is a human ancestor. So this was coupled with the fact that he was an Australian. Uh, so in other words, he was a he was a convict, an ex-convict. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and he was working in South Africa and the colonies, and not many people took him seriously, but of course, we now know that he was absolutely right. And these are various pictures of Raymond Dart. This is him um, at the time he wrote the paper in 1925. So, um, and then he was involved in another discovery in South Africa, um, just before the Second World War, uh, which was of a creature which had larger, larger chewing teeth and a more rugged face. And don't forget the Tong discovery was of a child. So that was an even bigger problem. How do you know this is, you know, a new species if it's just, a, you know, the skull of a child and it's got all the wrong sort of combination? It doesn't have a large brain and so on and so forth. Robert Broom was involved in that. Um, not Raymond Dart. Robert Broom was a paleontologist. He actually was a medical doctor, so was Dart. So there is a theme here in that it's really only in this country where um, most of the people interested in, in biological anthropology and in, and in human evolution were trained in anthropology departments. In most in Europe, most of the people involved were medical people, because if you found anything that looked like a human, you took it to your local medical school, where there would be an anatomist who would probably be able to tell you what it was. So there's a very different uh, tradition. So this is Robert Broom. He um, worked as a doctor in the high belt. He, um, he was, worked in small towns in the Karoo. He was apparently a bit of a womanizer, so he was constantly moving from one town to the other. So he's got, got a little, little too hot for him. Um, and he, he was not only interested in these fossils, he was convinced that Dart was right. So, so he was very eager to try and find some more fossils that would show the world that Dart was not, you know, was being sensible. And the other thing is that he that he was interested in the evolution of mammal-like reptiles. And he was made a fellow of the Royal Society, not because of his work on human evolution, but because of his work on these mammal-like reptiles. And this is John Robinson, if you know anything about the history of paleoanthropology, who was, who was also much involved in discoveries in, in Southern Africa. And more evidence of Homo erectus was found between the turn of the century and 19... Um, and the mid-century, this was in part not the discoveries, but the subsequent discoveries were the work of Davidson Black, who was a Canadian anatomist working in the Peking Union Medical College. And Really, for the first time, there was a non-medical person involved in, in, in discoveries to do with human evolution, and this is a man called Ralph von Königsberg. You can see here, he's looking at fossils that he had um, recovered from the island of Java in the 1930s. So there were discoveries of what was known as Chokyu Tien, but when the, uh, the Chinese changed their, uh, their spelling, it became Zugu Dian. And then there were, there were these discoveries, uh, which were made in um, <coughs> not far from the, the, uh, the place where Dubois had found the original evidence of, uh, of what we now call Homo erectus. 
So now if we jump to 1990, um, you can see that there are more taxes. And, and by 1990, <coughs> um, Homo habilis had been discovered, and what we now call Paranthropus boisei had been discovered. And those discoveries were made in East Africa largely as the result of the work of Lewis Leakey and Mary Leakey, and you can see them here holding the cranium of, of Paranthropus boisei, the type specimen of um, Paranthropus boisei. So those are pictures of Lewis, and those are pictures of Mary. And there is the, the upper jaw of the type specimen of, of what we now call Paranthropus boisei. And it was known that if you went to the dentist at that time in the, 19, the early 1960s, uh, there would be National Geographic magazines and it would say, the discovery of Nutcracker Man. And so I got all, my, all the information I know about human, human evolution from the National Geographic which very sadly is now owned by Rupert Murdoch. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and the other person who was intimately involved with the description of the fossils that became known as Homo habilis and Paranthropus boisei was Philip Tobias. And although he was mainly involved in the excavation at a site called Sturkfontein in southern Africa, he was the person that the that the Leakeys chose to describe the fossils that they have been finding at Old Dubai Gorge. Um, the, we now go to a period when, um, <coughs> so, so up till the late 1960s, most of the activity in Africa had been either concentrated on the, the cave sites in southern Africa, and the only site in East Africa which was really productive, apart from some, just a few fossils that had been found from a site that we now know as, we now know as Lytoli, most of the other fossils came from Old Dubai Gorge. So there is a real shift in terms of where people were looking for fossils, because this marked the, the beginning of an effort to go and find fossils in the, the Omo Valley, in the, uh, the southern part of, uh, in the southern part of Ethiopia. And an expedition was put together. It was, it was a French, it was a French-American, and the Kenyan expedition. The, the, uh, the French, uh, French expedition was eventually led by, uh, by, a, by a much younger, um, much younger Yves Coppens. The American expedition was always going to be led by Clark Howe. And the, uh, the Kenyan expedition was, was going to be led by Lewis Leakey, but, uh, but Lewis Leakey did not, um, he was unwell, and so his place was, uh, was taken by Richard Leakey. So uh, the, the Omo research expedition went to what we now know as the Shungura Formation, and that was in 1967. The, the, the area being explored was sort of carved up. Basically, the Americans and the French took the best bit, and they gave the less exciting areas to Richard Leakey, this young guy from Kenya. Um, and basically, the only thing that uh, Richard found, <laughs> Richard and his colleagues found in 1967, was some uh, some um, um, the remains of some isolated. Kids at the place of white sand or brown sand, and a couple of rather modern human looking, looking crania, but nobody knew how old they were. And so, and so Richard thought to hell with this. Um, I'm not going to go back. Um, 
I'm going to go and find my own place. And on my way up and down from Nairobi to, to southern Ethiopia, he had noticed that there were lots of exposures in Kenya and not in Ethiopia. <coughs> so that began the, uh, the research of what was then called Lake Rudolph, and is now called Lake, Lake Chukam. And then Richard, once it became plain that there was some archaeology there, he, um, he invited a colleague with whom he had worked at a place called Peninj, um, a man called Bill Isaac, who is, a, um, who is an archaeologist, who is a lovely man, and he unfortunately died much too early, but, but he taught me whatever I know about archaeology. Um, and then that work at Kubifora resulted in more evidence of parenthesis, boise eye, the work in, in the southern Ethiopia resulted in specimens that might well be ancestral to parenthesis, boise eye, and the work around Lake Rudolph that was in Lake Chikana, that is, resulted in more evidence of uh, of the, uh, the species that, uh, that Lewis and Mary had found at Alderby Point. Maybe Rudolph Ensis is a separate species, maybe not. And the, the, uh, the shares in Rudolph Ensis you know, were high and then they went low. <laughs> now they've gone up again. Okay. So you know, the shares in all these taxa are you know, not Sometimes there are enthusiasts for these taxa, and then sometimes there are not. So then also, before 1990, saw the initial discoveries in Ethiopia at a place called Hadar. Uh, uh, yeah, a place called Hadar. And these discoveries were made as the result of an expedition put together by a French um, a geologist called Maurice Taillem and a young man who was recommended by Clark Howell to Maurice Tyen, um, who was working at the OMO, a young man called Don Johansson. And you will all know that um, uh, that initial expedition was, uh, there were many more field seasons, and these guys recovered a lot of, a lot of evidence of what's known as Australopithecus afarensis. And that evidence included an associated skeleton, which, uh, which goes by the name of Lucy. This material is all, the, there is none of it which is much older than 4 million years, and there is not much younger than 3 million years. And if you remember the diagram of the living species, the hypothetical common ancestor of chimps, bonobos, and modern humans probably lived around six million years ago, maybe plus a million years, maybe minus a million years. So we're now getting relatively close to when the molecular biologist would suggest the hypothetical common ancestor of chimps, bonobos, and modern humans lived. So if we go forward a decade, in the middle of, 19, of the 1990s, there was a paper, there was a paper published that uh, suggested there had been a discovery made, and not at Hadar, but a little further south in what's called the Middle Arch. And that discovery was put into a new species of Australopithecus, and it was called Australopithecus rabbits. Then a year later, in a little, little piece in Nature that said, you know, we made a bit of a mistake, maybe it shouldn't have been in Australopithecus, we're going to put it in a new genus called, and that new genus is going to be called Ardipithecus. So that was the, the first time the world knew about Ardipithecus ramulus. Um, just a nod in the direction of John Kalb, who had worked in the Middle Arwash Valley before, um, before Desmond Clark and Tim White, and in fact, 
Many of the sites that they found fossils that were recorded by John Cowell. So the work in the Middle Awash was a combination of the, uh, the two people leading the research in the Middle Awash were Desmond Clark and a young man called Tim White. And these people, until Desmond's death, they were sort of an odd couple. Okay. It was Desmond who was extremely British. Um, I say old chap. Um, wonderful to see him. Uh, you know, a bit like a sort of, you know, a bit like Peter Sellers playing an English major. <laughs> then Tim White, who was not like that. But nonetheless, these two guys got on because they were both really convinced that, you know, the only way you can make any progress is to find more fossils or find more archaeology. And they worked together very successfully in the middle hours. And among the discoveries they made, along with an Ethiopian colleague called um, um, Bahani Aswan, was the, uh, this was the initial evidence of Arnipithecus ramnus. It was just a piece of job. It was just a tiny piece of chance It was just a tiny piece of a child's jaw. And then between 1993 and 1995, <coughs> they excavated this associated skeleton, which was published in Science. Um, there was almost a whole issue of Science devoted to not just this skeleton, but the other material that had been found. Basically, what these guys, uh, what these guys uh, suggested was that at whatever the age of 4.4 million years, they had found the earliest hominid. They had found the common ancestor of all later hominids. Now, that um, the evidence was, some of it was more convincing than others. Uh, they claim that this thing was bipedal, and yet it has, you know, if you look at the toe, it's sort of like this. And, you know, you don't see many modern human bipeds with the toe like that. They made all sorts of uh, suggestions about what the pelvis meant, but actually the pelvis is a mess. I mean, it's all squashed. But, uh, but to give them... To give them their credit, this material was just incredibly, incredibly soft and brittle. So it was a triumph to actually, it was a triumph to, to, uh, to excavate the material that they did find. But, but it's not entirely surprising uh, that, uh, that some of it was in really bad condition. So also between 1990 and 2000, Mead Leakey was involved in the discoveries um, on the west and the south side of Lake Turkana of what became known as Australopithecus animensis, and you can see me here just scraping the sand away from the jaw, and you can see them um, working on this material. And it looks as if Australopithecus animensis uh, that makes a reasonable ancestor for Australopithecus aberensis, just as just as Paranthropus ethiopicus makes a reasonable ancestor for Paranthropus poisi. But you will have noticed that there is something strange about all these diagrams I'm, uh, that I'm showing you. Uh, what is strange about them? Well, not strange, but is there anything missing? This is, meant to be a, you know, this is meant to be about evolutionary history. Is there anything missing? Well, I didn't know it's missing any lines. Okay. So I'm not sort of drawing a line between Homo habilis and Homo erectus, or a line between Australopithecus afarensis and Homo habilis, or a line between Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus robustus, because, although some of my colleagues do not share my skepticism, um, <coughs> 
there are not many relationships which are well supported ancestral descendant relationships. That's one of them and that's another. And that's, you know, if I was playing poker then I would, that's it, okay. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna bet on anything else. Uh, <laughs> So then we go to Sahelanthropus chalensis. And this was the result of discoveries made by Michel Brunet, who uh, went to work in the Chant um, Desert. And he discovered this cranium here of <coughs> what he called Sahelanthropus chalensis. And this is probably around 7 million years old which is at the older end of the time bracket that the molecular biologists would suggest for the common ancestor of chimps, bonobos, and modern humans. And for my money, it's, it's, it's not a hominin. It's probably an extinct clay that's, that's somewhere, somewhere between the modern human clay and the chimp bonobo clay. And you can... See here, there's a very evident ridge around the base of the canine there. And that's the sort of ridge you see in apes, but you don't see it in early hominids. And this is a, this is a reconstruction of the Sahelanthropus cranium. Um, and the, one of the points they make is that the frame of magnum is pretty, is pretty horizontal, whereas in common chimpanzees it tends to face so that the, um, it would tend to face this way, um, sorry, that way. Um, but in bonobos, the, uh, the foramen magnum is about where it is in Sahelanthropus chalensis. So then we come to a roaring chugonensis, and note that these guys do not like using other people's genera. Okay. <laughs> They'd like to come up with their own gem. And this is a French discovery made by Martin, Martin Pickford and um, uh, Brigitte Sanyu. The only thing they have of it is, is a proximal femur, which is remarkably like the femur of Australopithecus afarensis. Um, and some other remains of the femur and distal humerus. It's really, apart from the femur, it's pretty ape-like. You know, if you found that in Europe, you would have no compunction that it was an ape. And lastly, Artipithecus cadaver, which, uh, which was discovered by Johannes Heinrich Selassie. And um, here are the canines of a chimpanzee. Here are the canines of cadaver. I rest my case. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really ape-like. Um, okay, now we come towards the present. Then there is Lee Berger's discoveries of a cave called Malacca. And uh, uh, this is the, the cave behind here and the, the cranium from one of the two associated skeletons. Um, here is the, uh, here is one of them which is, um, which is juvenile and the other one which is less complete. They, um, they're claiming that this is something different from Australopithecus, uh, from Australopithecus africanus and might make a plausible ancestor of Homo. And there was a recent paper that, uh, in the proceedings of the Royal Society of Biology that's Suggested it might make a, it might make a plausible ancestor of the, ge of the genus Homo, but the problem is that the data they were using are really crummy data, um, and they're using these rather crummy data to do a cladistic analysis. And they claim that this uh, cladistic analysis is powerful because they collect together a lot of data. But in my humble opinion. Um, 
My view is that a large amount of crummy data is probably not more useful than a small amount of crummy data. <laughs> and, and, you know, just because you're doing a meta-analysis of crummy data does not really help. So, what about Homo Nalini? Um, Homo Nalini uh, was, uh, was announced last week and it was found in a cave um, where the access is really difficult. The cave's in, in pitch dark. There are probably at least 15 individuals. Um, uh, the morphology is interesting. Some of the, they have small brains. Uh, the brain size is around 500 cc's. Uh, but they have quite modern human-like teeth in terms of size, and the, and the jaw is modern human-like. The hand has quite curved finger bones, but there are modern humans that have uh, the fingers that curved, but otherwise the morphology is pretty modern, and the foot morphology is pretty modern. It really reminds me, I went to the Barnes Foundation yesterday, and there are a couple of rooms in the Barnes Foundation where there is an El Greco next to a Cezanne. So Homo Nalini is a bit like somebody saying that they have discovered 15 canvases in different states of preservation. And these are all, these are all oil paintings. And what's intriguing about these oil paintings is that some of the painting is in the style of El Greco and some of the painting is in the style of Cezanne. So that's the good news. <laughs> bad news is that they don't know who painted them, and they don't know when they were painted. And so, you know, the question is this, somebody painting at the time of El Greco having premonitions of, you know, Cezanne, you know, late Cezanne, or is this somebody painting at the time of Cezanne harking back to the style of El Greco, or is this somebody painting at any time between El Greco and Cezanne? We don't know. So exactly... So, yeah, I mean, the discovery of these paintings would be surely relevant to the history of art. Would it change the way I think about the history of art? No. Not until I know a little more about when these were painted and a little more about the context of the paintings. And that's a bit the way I think we should regard uh, the lead. I mean, it's a very interesting series of discoveries. They claim, you know, now that anybody finds just a single bone, you know, you can't say anything about a single bone because we have 15 individuals. That's rubbish because um, some of these taxa, you only have to find half a molar tooth and you know it's different from the rest. So, um, so I think uh, the jury is still out in, in relation to whom and the need. So I talked in the title about hominin... Um, uh, diversity and, and really diversity in the way that we talk about it means how many of these of these guys and girls were alive at any at any particular time and if more than one hominin species was alive was alive at any particular time especially in the same continent that would be evidence of taxonomic diversity and my my take of looking at the evidence is <coughs> that there is not much evidence of taxic diversity or taxonomic diversity up to here, largely because the fossil records of these guys hardly overlap in terms of what regions of the body are represented. So it's a bit like saying, you know, if this is a Ford fusion. But the only thing I'm going to tell you about, you know, I'm going to show you about the Ford Fusion is the lid of the trunk and the, uh, the gearbox. You know, but this is, a, you know, this is a Honda Accord, but the only thing I'm going to show you of the Honda Accord is the, uh, the radiator and, and one of the wheels. Well, you know, I don't know that these two things are different because I don't have anything in common that I can compare. That's not quite true because, but you know, we know nothing. We know nothing about the uh, 
and we know nothing below the knee about the rolling chicken ancestor, and we know nothing about the wrist bones, yet we know a lot about the wrist bones, the wrist bones of Ramidus, and we know a lot about the foot. We know almost <coughs> nothing about cadaver's lower limb, and we have no, no evidence of Sahelanthropus um, chalensis below the neck. So it's not clear to me there is strong evidence for diversity there, but once you get here, there is no period of human evolutionary history where there was just a single species in the, the fossil record. You then have to add in the Denisovans, where there is a fossil record, but it's, it's just a few teeth and a little finger bone. Uh, but it's clearly genetically distinct from Neanderthals and modern humans. And if the material from the Cima de los Suesos in Spain belongs to Heidelbergensis, then it's also different from that. And then the, mole the molecular biologists say that there is a ghost taxon for which we have no fossil evidence, but they claim it had to exist, otherwise the genetic diversity that you see in modern humans <coughs> couldn't have come about. Um, that's, that's probably a terrible explanation. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so although there's only one creature alive today, you don't have to go far back in human evolutionary history, maybe 50,000 years when there was probably Homo erectus in Asia, there were Neanderthals in Europe. Um, there were the Denisovans. So the, the, the notion that you know, there's one species now and there has always just been one species in the past, so human evolution is a series of ancestors and descendants, that probably doesn't fly. So, um, so extinction has happened many times in human evolutionary history. Your job and my job is to make sure it doesn't happen one more time <laughs> because we only have one species. Okay. Okay, we do not have the luxury of you know, lots of representatives of the hominid trade. So thank you very much for your invitation and I hope this was <coughs> mildly more enlightening than confusing but I suspect it hovered on the balance between the two. selection in order to get the, uh, the phenotypic diversity that we see in the fossil record. And for some parts of the skeleton, there is no need to invoke a selection. You can just do this with drift. And for other parts of the skeleton, you do need a selection. So it, it depends on the parts of the skeleton, and it depends on what period of evolutionary history. But once you get to the origin of Homo, you know, and then you would say, well, you know, how do you define homo? Well, you know, do you define homo because it's something that doesn't look like these archaic hominids? Or does it have something which we see in later homo? In other words, you know, to my mind, homo needs to be an obligate biped. It probably needs to no longer have large chewing teeth. It needs to have relatively small chewing teeth. It should probably have no longer large jaws. I'm really less exercised about brain size. You know, I'm more interested in how it moved around, what its diet was. Um, 
And then if you use those criteria, then there's a lot of discussion about whether Homo habilis makes a cut. Because I don't think there is any evidence that it's an obligate biped in the way that Homo erectus is an obligate biped. Um, so you either draw the boundary of Homo down here, or you draw the boundary of you draw the boundary of Homo there. But then you ask yourself, well, does Homo floresiensis deserve to be in Homo if it has an endocranial volume of of less than 400 cc's, and the answer is, well, you know, probably something one should think about. <coughs> yes? Could you speak at all to what appears to be some of the diversity in, in the form of vitality itself, uh, even after artificial experiments? That's interesting. The, the, you know, in order to be bipedal, you, well, not in order, but you know, one of the consequences of being bipedal is you have to balance the head. You have to be able to balance on, um, you know, you have to be able to walk and keep your balance, which either means you, you transfer your body weight to each limb or you have muscles that stop you tilting over and things of that sort. Certainly, I was taught that only hominins are bipedal. That seems to me might be true, but it might not be true. There might be bipedal apes. Um, and the other thing is that is there only one way for hominins to be bipedal? And the answer is no. If you look at the, uh, the South African, if you look at the South African fossil record and you compare it to Afarensis and you look at things like uh, the size of the joints of the the shoulder joint and the hip joint, it's clear that there is more than one, um, there is one, there is more than one early hominin phenotype which is consistent with the bipedal locomotion. Yes? In the examples where you only have one fossil or one well, I mean, there are, there are very few where you only have one fossil, but there are quite a lot where you have no more fossils than the fingers of my you know, the fingers that you have. So maybe the question isn't relevant then, but I was wondering how scientists eliminate the possibility of individual mutations or Um They don't, because some of my colleagues are convinced that Homo floresiensis is, is a, you know, some sort of pathology. And, and in the past, um, the explanation for Homo for Neanderthals was that they were just you know a bunch of pathological idiots, literally. Okay. Um, the problem with the, the, uh, the pathological sort of explanation is that it is just as exotic as the fact that there might be a new species. You know, and every time you know you discover some behaviour, if you're a cultural anthropologist, you say, well, that's not you know a normal behaviour. That's because they were. I don't know, you know, doing this kind of the other. Um, my sense is that the null hypothesis should be that, in, that unless we can really demonstrate pathology, we assume that what we're observing is, is normal, you know, whatever normal is. That doesn't mean that, you know, one of the problems is that when they discovered Australopithecus uh, sediba, they said, oh, you know, we think it's a different species than Australopithecus africanus because it, you know, the range of tooth size is outside the range of tooth size of the fossil evidence for Australopithecus africanus. Well, the fossil evidence for Australopithecus africanus does not circumscribe the variation in the species. Um, you know, it's just the evidence we have on it. So, you're absolutely right in the sense that, so that people, you know, they tend to create more species than are probably needed. That doesn't mean they're all not necessary. Um, and there's one here that I haven't put on, which is one that was created relatively recently uh, around the time of Afarensis, and frankly, I just don't think the evidence is compelling enough. Um, the evidence for Sediba being different than Africanus may be sort of slightly more compelling. The evidence, you know, I didn't talk about Australopithecus barrel gazali because it's just a few specimens, literally less than the fingers of your hand, and I don't think it's different from Afarensis. Um, uh, 
uh, just to spare you an even more complicated uh, discussion, I didn't talk about osteopathicus gahi, which is a very strange creature. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's like nothing, you know, it's, it's very strange. <laughs> and, you know, all we have is a cranium and, you know, and a bunch of teeth. But, it, you know, believe me, it's not like anything that, you know, is on that diagram. Yes. Do you find it striking at all that with all the discoveries we have of various hominid fossils and all, we have very little in the way of ancestors of Chirpsum and Ethos? Oh, or I find it very striking. <laughs> I find it very striking because if you had tried to publish Ardipithecus ramidus and you were claiming that it was fossil elements of an extinct clade, perhaps you know, somehow between modern humans and chimps, it would not have created such a stir as saying you have found the earliest <coughs> And the fossil evidence for chimpanzees, you know, consists of about a handful of teeth, which are about 600,000 years old. So there must be evidence. It's just that uh, we've I, I, either found it and called it hominin because that's sort of sexier. But you know, I mean, if I was, if I was looking for fossils, I wouldn't be at all interested in finding any more hominid fossils. <laughs> you know, I'd be interested in trying to find, you know, some fossil evidence of chimpanzees and whatever, or I'd be interested to see whether there is any evidence of any, of any creatures which were living alongside early hominids and the ancestors of chimpanzees. Yeah, I asked in part because not so long ago there's, I don't think it was given at the time it was published, a uh, name, a Latin name. But there's the uh, grasping toe foot. With the foot, the, uh, the Bertini foot. Yes, that's, that's probably... It's like three million that, or something. That's probably the same thing as Ramos. I've wondered, yeah. You know, but I mean, you know, I mean the, 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 the most economical <coughs> explanation, of, explanation of the Bertini foot is that it is Ramidus, or it could belong to you know another species, but you know that would be a little rash on the basis of one foot. But it's certainly not the foot of Australopithecus afarensis. And when I say not, you know that's trying to do the mental, you know, the 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 that's trying to imagine what a large population of Australopithecus afarensis feet. It would look like. And even if you do that thought experiment, you don't end up with a machine. Yes? I was interested that you didn't talk much about tool use. Because I didn't know anything about tool use. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you find that it's a helpful distinction for Homo versus Australopithecus? I've never seen any of them using tools. Okay. So, why I think if you you know make the assumption that only Homo can use tools and make and use tools, then you define Homo on the basis of the manufacture and use of tools, you will very soon disappear up your nether regions because it's a circular argument. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a claim for aerial in the um, <laughs> my 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 doctor told me I shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, how did this work for God's sake? It's as black as anything else. It's completely dark. Okay. You have to crawl through a space so narrow that these cavers have to turn their helmets because it could, you know, they could only go through some of it this way and then they have to turn, and just like being born, you have to turn your head to get out. Um, and, and, how the hell did this, you know, I mean, I have no idea what they were smoking when they came up with this thing. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's, you know, the Breaking Bad people would have, would have, would have, would have you know, would have loved to have made it. I mean, I have no idea, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you take whole bodies down a cave, you know, that's unlit, you know, you either have got, you know, a bunch of twigs and, no, it's a hundred yards from the entrance. But would the cave have been the same? Well, they came in. You know, 
it's like Sherlock Holmes, you know, once you have eliminated the impossible, you know, what remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And I can, you know, systematic burial is not, you know, is not the truth. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So, uh, yes. Well, it's a quite a striking talk that you gave, um, and I specifically noticed that you didn't draw any lines, and yep. that you mentioned you didn't draw any lines. Yep. Uh, given that it lacks lines, uh, do you think that there should be uh, that people should take a look at this issue and reevaluate uh, the yeah, state I mean, on the academic level and the textbook? Level? Oh yes. The textbook should be basically rewritten to reflect. Oh, I mean, Sorry. look, you know, I'm not I'm smart sorry, enough to get you to rewrite. No, I'm just saying, with your humble opinion. Well, you know, my humble opinion, we haven't come up with a good enough method to reconstruct phylogeny. And the difficulty is that if you read science journals like Nature or Science almost every week, they come up with a molecular phylogeny which conflicts with, with a morphological phylogeny. And so it's clear that the more that the phenotype is quite often telling you whoopsies about relationships. You know, because our assumption is the more similar you are, the more closely related you are. But if the reasons that you're similar were the result of, um, of evolutionary trends that were separate but resulted in a similar phenotype, then you know, you can't use phenotype to, to, you know, to reconstruct relationships. Or you can, but you need, you know, it's like advertising. Everybody knows, you know, half of advertising is wasting. The question is nobody knows which half. <laughs> and, you know, everybody knows that the phenotype is, is giving you unreliable information about relationships. Probably about a third of the phenotype. We're trying to work out which. The well, what about the genotype? Can you, can you look at the, the genotype? genotype I'm not qualified to answer about. Because if you think I'm standing on thin ice here, if I tell you something about the genotype, it would just be not worth it. The, the, the genotype, the reason I'm convinced about the uh, genomic evidence is that the genomic evidence is just consistent. Okay. It's just consistent, whereas the phenotypic evidence is not always consistent. Arbitrary. Well, it's not arbitrary. It's just not consistent. And so, you know, you need to work out, you know, when I was allowed, you know, everybody said, oh, you know, the head and neck is going to tell you information about phylogeny. Don't believe anything to do with the limbs because limbs, you know, it's all functional and it's probably going to evolve more, you know, likely to evolve in parallel or convergently. Now we know that, that that's not the case. So that's what I'm, when I'm not coming here, that's what I'm working on, trying to work out how you, what parts of morphology are going to be more reliable for reconstructing phylogeny. Yes, and then. Uh, my question is about extinction. So if we have now one species and there used to be more than one, and this is an extinction seminar, okay. yeah. so do we know what why they became extinct? Do we we, we know, you know, some of my colleagues, bless their cotton socks, you know, they take, you know, these extinction events and they say, ah, there must be something happening in the climate that results in all these things becoming extinct. I've already tried to persuade you that the tops of these lines probably mean nothing. Okay. So, you know, to try and sort of chase a series of external events to explain the tops of those columns is probably a waste of time. <coughs> the thing you have to realize is that if you look at mammal evolution across the board, the average time that a mammalian species stays in the fossil record is about a million years. Okay? And there's not a great deal of variation. So it sort of seems that mammals get weary after a million years. You know? God knows, you have to ask Tad why. But, but uh, 
So, sometimes, you know, you don't have to seek an external explanation. Stuff just happens. You know? Stuff happens. Now, it's not a very convincing information. That's not a very convincing response, but I would urge you not to think that there has to be a reason for this line being here and that line being there. You know, because the, where those lines are is, is a function of where the fossils are preserved and where those sediments are exposed, which has nothing to do, <laughs> you know, it's you know, it's happening millions of years after those animals were alive. Yeah. Follow up on what you said. Some of that stuff just happens. Um, Henry Bergson in Creative Evolution says it would be difficult to cite a biological discovery due to pure reasoning. And most often, when experience has finally shown us how life chose to work to obtain a certain result, we find a way of working is just that which we should never have thought. So throughout this, you've said that you have to look for economic explanations, uh, there's a principle of parsimony. Yeah. You started with this sort of logical syntax where everybody needs a mom and dad and grandpa yeah. and so forth. Um, that being the case, so it was kind of Darwin's point that there is this kind of overabundance of accident in evolution. So is it the case that taxonomy by introducing a logic of parsimony, in a sense, makes it impossible to understand evolution as accident in determinants? Okay, that's a sort of IV question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think all of those things are true. Okay. Um, you have to realize that these, you know, these names are all hypotheses. They're not, you know, I do not have access, you know, to God's stud book. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I do not, you know, wherever she keeps it, I do not, you know, I have not seen it. Some of my colleagues give the strong impression that they have seen it, and that they were sent to Earth just to tell us what, what, what's, you know, what's in it. Uh, but I wasn't. Okay. But there is a natural phylogeny, you know, I mean, that, you know, I'm enough of a Darwinian to think that, you know, the tree of life is a perfectly good analogy for life on Earth, and there is a natural phylogeny. My job is to find it. But a, but a natural phylogeny exists. If it doesn't exist, then I should be working in Wawa. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Ron Clark has held on to Prometheus yes. as uh, Littlefoot's... Uh, Bless his cotton socks. Yeah. I agree with you. I was just wondering if you could comment on Prometheus in there. Also, on the, maybe six months ago, the, the Joel Mandible from... Um, oh, from Lady Guerrero. Yeah, Lady yeah. Guerrero. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think the Jaw Mandible from Lady Guerrero is not the same as Oscar Right, well, they say it's it. homo, right? Well, they say it's homo because it has some features with the jaws of later homo, and I'm not going to argue with them. But, you know, am I going to put more than five dollars on that? No. <laughs> um, Ron thinks that there are two taxa represented by the, the fossil evidence which the rest of the world thinks is Australopithecus africanus, and the rest of the world is right. Well, I mean, they, the rest of the world's hypothesis is more reasonable than Ron's hypothesis. Um, the, the common ones are, I'm from Croatia, so a bit more obscure European country. So I just wanted to mention. It's not, I mean, you've just got absolutely wonderful fossil evidence. Yeah, 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 but the good thing that Amrich Gramberger was actually trained as a paleontologist right. and not an MD. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention. Oh, that. thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, so okay. He stayed in Germany by anatomist and paleontologist. But well, thank you for never did medicine in his life. Um, but uh, what I was wondering, um, you choose to separate um, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals at the species level, but you don't let you distinguish Hydrobrigensis from, you don't separate out Brutisiensis and Hydrobrigensis. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if you could. Well, you know, I mean, this thing could be made more complicated. My feeling, and you know, I don't, this is not my period. 
you know, I mean, I don't, you know, I haven't seen the original fossil evidence. I just read what people who I think are smart write about. Them. My, you, know, you could put Rhodesiensis here, and you could suggest that Rhodesiensis is the ancestor of of Homo sapiens, and that Heidelbergensis is the ancestor of Neanderthals. My view is that just is not really enough evidence. You know, Rhodesiensis is represented by some crania, by some, uh, some uh, one or two postcranial bones, but that's it. And my view is that just isn't enough evidence to sustain that is a separate taxon, but I, you know, I mean, there's no reason why you should listen to me about that period, because it's not my period. Could you choose to separate out Neanderthals from Homo sapiens? Yes. So in other words, if you were, you know, if you were one, you know, if you were being even more of a splitter than this diagram suggests, you would have Erectus going into Rhodesiensis, going to Sapiens, and you would have Erectus going into Hydrobergensis, into Neanderthals, and then zip. Well, you know, a few genes from Neanderthalensis into modern humans, but essentially Neanderthals are extinct. Yeah, yes. Okay, can I get a glass of water? Yes. You better tell me when this should stop. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in knowing about the debate you mentioned in your after. swinging towards a more diverse interpretation of the fossil record. But, you know, the pendulum swings, you know. And I don't know whether it swings in, you know, cultural anthropology, but it certainly swings in, you know, it swings in paleoanthropology. There are really very few people who still subscribe to, to interpreting the hominid fossil record as just a series of ancestors and descendants. I think it's very I mean, for example, Brantibus boisei is such a strange creature that in order to think about its diet, um, we use an analogy between the giant panda and the bear. Okay. I mean, you know, there is no living primate that looks at all like this. I mean, you know, if the fossils of Paranthropus boisei had not been found, it would be my, in my humble opinion, nobody would ever have invented it. You know, I mean, nothing we know about living primates would allow you to reconstruct a human, you know, a close relative um, a couple of million years ago with a dentition like that. You know, you could have. No. Another question uh, about, um, it was an eventful year, but uh, about Australopithecus de Ramada. Yeah. I think just that forensic. Yeah, I think it's just me. Yeah. Yes? I was just going on with this question. Uh, most people accept that it is tree, more tree branch connected model, but given that people are creating new species and facts all the time, do you think that there's sort of a new way to then look at this tree model? Or well, my view is that until you have a hypothesis, um, you know, about relationships which you think is reasonably reliable, then it's best not to confuse your mind and the confuse the minds of the other people by suggesting that you have. It doesn't create. Well, the names have nothing to do with how they're related. Right. I mean, you know, the names are just a sort of a hypothetical statement to say that I think this collection of fossils was not sampled from the same species as this collection of fossils. Isn't that a relationship? Sorry? 
them not being the same thing. No. Relation. No. Well, I mean, though, is it, if they're the same species, yeah, they're related. But you know, they're related because they're the same thing. Um, like males and females are related. You know, and, you know, they're males and females of a single species. But once you have a hypothesis that I think I'm I'm collecting fossils which sample a taxon which is not currently represented in, in hominin taxonomy, then I have to generate a new you know, a hypothesis that I'm sampling a different taxon. And that's all those names are. You know, in five years' time, we might find more fossils that sort of, uh, that uh, um, what looks like a space between them might in five years' time be occupied. And you say, okay, that wasn't, wasn't such a bright hypothesis after all. So I, will, um, so I will change it. But in general, it's actually easier to merge species into a, one species than to take a single species and then split it. So I'm more inclined to represent the evidence in the species way and acknowledge that what I have as separate species here may turn out not to be separate. Yes. Go ahead. Um, thank you for your talk. This is not. I am a kind of historian of science. So what I'm more interested, what, what I think is really nice about this, and also from New Zealand, don't worry, you didn't send me with your Australian We were the smart ones who were smart. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> so what I'm interested in is this kind of is like a nice symmetry between this story and the story of like the creation of the field. Right, like the history of building the knowledge that becomes this field of scientific research and study. And what I am wondering, and maybe this is too big a question, but what are the like social and pol maybe political like implications between things like the the hoax discovery and uh, you know, is are there driving reasons that are happening throughout the 19th and 20th century that encourage or discourage people from seeking certain hypotheses? Well, I think there are. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I, but I'm, I'm trying to put myself into the minds of the people who do this, but I think, you know, there are, there are people who work in South Africa who think that South Africa has had a bad, you know, a bad rap compared to, you know, the people who work in East Africa, and that, you know, folks like me sort of, you know, they tend to think, you know, I tend to think that, South Africa is a geographical cul-de-sac, and probably what's happening in evolutionary history there in the Hominin clay probably is not as relevant as what's happening around the equator. So I think you know this leads them to be really very vigorous about the promotion of the fact that there may be species in South Africa that don't occur <coughs> elsewhere. So in terms of you know there being explanations for why people you know become enthusiastic supporters of certain hypotheses and not others, yes, I think there probably are. Yeah. It's not something I think you can really generalize about, but I think there probably are. Yeah. Maybe one last question. I work in South Africa and in the Cradle for the time. And I think one of the things that we're seeing with new species arriving on a yearly basis might be that with big funding and cameras rolling, you are expected to produce. And when you find something with 15 individuals, only a handful of them have postprandial traits, where the rest of the variation falls within the range of Homo ergaster and Homo erectus, you are almost obligated to call it a new species, even though it's probably a reckless. Why? But, um, yeah. you know, but nobody's going to take, you know, you're not going to have a whole bunch of journalists buying tickets to South Africa to say, I've discovered more of them than right. yes. um, But, you know, that's just a fact of life, and you're not going to have the journalists buying tickets to Washington to the announcement of Ardipithecus Ramadus, you know, all those papers in science saying, you know, I think I've found, you know, a bit more of something else. So, so I think, you know, there is a, you know, there is a, 
you know, we need to have a healthy sort of skepticism about all these new species. You know, to what extent are they supported by evidence? You know, to what extent is this you know, a bunch of people handing around Kool-Aid and, 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 you know, and, and sort of, you know, everybody's saying, wow, yeah, yeah. And you say, wow, yeah, but, you know, have you seen the Phillies record, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah, I think I'm right. And the more people who are interested in the history of this science, the better. You know, because it's a really interesting area. You know, the people involved, the influence that people have, uh, the influence that their prejudices have. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting topic. Maybe one more question. In the same yeah. uh, uh, so uh, you asked about these, uh, basically answering other questions about the tree of life, and you said that there's like a tree which exists in your class. But does like the tree exist in the form like that is considered with like a trunk and branches, mm. some branches when we are actually seeing like uh, yeah, I think it has to. You know, I mean, if we if we were discussing the evolutionary history of frogs, this would not be controversial. <laughs> right now, I was thinking more in terms of uh, when you look at our mixture of, uh, Oh, what well, I mean, the the the. That sort of diagram, you know, does not probably capture the nuances of the fact that there is probably, you know, there are times where there is that mixture, and, you know, and so on. So I would agree with you entirely. It's just that if I was to pick one, one image that, that if I was trying to convey what evolution meant, I would pick that tree. I would then have to explain that, you know, you need to take care of the details, but yes, yes, very nice. It's, it's not that all those, you know, all those branches ever exchange sort of genes. I'm sure they did. The question is, did they exchange enough genes for them no longer to be, no longer to be recognizable branches? And in most cases, the answer is no. You know, just because Neanderthals interbred with modern humans doesn't mean Neanderthals don't exist. You know, museums are arranged, you know, all the paintings are in that part of the museum and all the sculptures are there. You know, the fact that somebody paints and puts on the paint so thick that, you know, the painting is, you know, an inch and a half thick doesn't mean that there aren't paintings and there isn't sculpture. It just means there are a few three-dimensional paintings. So, so do you think it's a question of scale that we don't have as much evidence for our mixture at the moment so we can say that there's still the paintings and sculptures, or is it just if you know in the future that oh, a lot of painters actually make sculptures, then we might be considered that? That's an ideal question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question, which if I was an animal, you would be prosecuted for getting me to stand up here and answer questions for as long as I can. <laughs> so, um, that, 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 I'm, yeah, I mean, that's a question, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> I think that the, the, those taking the class were going to shift in the 327. Talk about all the way
Equipment. Where did Kyle go? 